Okay, um, that brings us to our next speaker for this session. Um, so for our next speaker, um, he's joining us from Chicago and he's currently leading the new R&D initiatives as a senior product manager at Auth0. Um, please give a warm welcome to Samuel Frank. Appreciate it, Catherine, thank you. Hi Sam, how are you doing? Hi. Good, how are you? Good to know my sound works. Uh, glad to be here. Just jump yeah. in then. Um, yeah, I'll, today he's gonna be talking about um, some insights about Auth0 and innovating using APIs to build fine-grained authorization. Um, your presentation looks good, take it away. Appreciate that, thank you. So yeah, my name uh, is Sam Frank. I'm uh, excited to be here. I've always wanted to uh, visit Australia and with everything going on in the world, this might be uh, as close as I get. So I'm gonna pretend it's a, a sunny afternoon in Australia instead of a uh, dark uh, late night here in Chicago. Um, as Catherine said, I work on the new initiatives team at Auth0. Uh, we work on things that are net new products that are uh, far out in the roadmap. Uh, we're excited to be able to talk about one of those initiatives that's been in the work for some time now um, that's unlocking fine grain authorization for all. So with that, I'm going to jump in. Um, just a little bit of context as we spend the next 25 minutes together. I'm going to talk a little bit about why software as a service for builders is taking over the world. Um, what's next uh, in that software as a service for builders, which is fine grain authorization as a service and then get into a little bit of how we're implementing uh, those services here at Auth0. And so why we're here has a lot to do with a realization that Bill Gates came to at his time in Microsoft, which is software doesn't really work like a lot of different industries because we don't have marginal costs. Once you produce one good version of something, virtually every unit after that is free to produce. You see this, um, idea when you plug in a library into your stack or when you use a service like Auth0. It's the underlying idea of our business is we build one good version of authentication that you can build into your stack so that instead of 100,000 app developers each building their own version of authentication, we can share the costs of one good version uh, between all of those different application providers. And this idea of building one good version of something and then sharing it with others isn't something that we're doing alone. There's a lot of organizations that are creating services like Twilio for communications, allowing you to plug into one good version to access uh, SMS gateways and call providers. Stripe building one good version of payment processing. Gone are the days where you have to worry about PCI compliance and holding credit card information on your side of the stack, you can let them deal with all of those worries and plug into their one good version. Amazon and GCP and other infrastructure providers building one good version of data centers and allowing you to access those through APIs um, and interfaces. And organizations like Datadog letting you access one good version of log aggregators and data aggregators. And when there's not one good version, as I said before, of something that you could plug in as software as a service, you can use a library and copy that and bring that into your stack. And so what this is leading to is an end game where all you have to do is write your business logic. You don't have to worry about working on all of the supporting code that it takes to operationalize your domain's business logic. So you can focus on building the one good version of whatever it is you're building and let other organizations uh, write all of that supporting code and package it for you so you can access it in your stack. And this allows you to improve your time to market as you're only focusing on the business logic, plugging into all of the supporting services, you get features out the door faster. It's cheaper for you to maintain good quality code that you're accessing through all these different applications because you're sharing that maintenance um, with all the different organizations that are using that one good version. It, forces you to go into a service-driven architecture because you're using all of those different services and cordoning off your business logic to focus on what it's good at and what it needs to do. And this ultimately creates a scenario where if you're not going to buy into these one good versions of all these different services, your competitors might, uh, and they might use those services 
um, to get their features out the door faster and to uh, operate leaner um, so that they can offer their services cheaper. And so that's why we see all these different organizations buying into developer SaaS and these one good versions um, of what's out there uh, to use to support your stack. And the end game is eventually there's gonna be no supporting code. There's just gonna be the business logic that you have to write. And then you're just gonna have to wire it up to all these different services that are needed to operationalize uh, your business logic. And so what's next in this world of developer SaaS? And so the project I'm here to talk to you about is Sandcastle, which is fine grain authorization as a service. So not everyone knows what authorization is, and that's kind of what I wanna dive into first before we talk about what it does for your application. So one of the things we like to talk about with authorization is authentication, because the two are often confused. Authentication is asking the question, are you who you say you are? So this is what Auth0's main focus is and has been for a long time, which is uh, the process that it takes to prove who I am, that I am Sam. I am, by the way. Um, and I do that by providing some sort of information, either on an identifier, like an ID, or maybe I tell you some secret passcode that I've told you before when I was setting up my account, garbly gook. And you know that whenever you hear a garbly gook from me, that means that I'm Sam. And that's what establishes authentication. Once you've established who someone is, you wanna know what can they do? So as a speaker at API Days, I might have authorization to access the software uh, to get into this talk today. Um, I might be able to get into a green room uh, behind the stage and talk to other speakers. All of that is what I'm authorized to do uh, as Sam. You know, one way to think about this is thinking about a secure data center or a secure building. Usually when you walk into a secure building, you've got to show some sort of ID. That's the authentication process. Maybe a guest badge gets printed out for you. And you take that guest badge around the building. You scan it at different doors. It might allow you to get into some office for someone that you're going to meet in that secure building. Um, but every time that you scan it at a door, that's an authorization check. Say you're a tech coming into work in a server center on a specific server. Fine grain authorization is the ability to give someone access to very minute pieces of your stack or your information. So in a fine grain authorization service, you might have tens of thousands of servers spread out globally, and you'd be able to authorize a technician to access just a single one of those servers in your stack. And so what is fine grain authorization good for? How does it improve your product and your stack. One of the most obvious examples is something that we see in more and more applications out there, which is the share button. Being able to share Google Documents uh, with coworkers, to be able to collaborate, to share in different ways. Um, so you're not just sharing as an editor, but maybe you wanna give uh, someone else just comment access uh, so you can look at your uh, document and just see the changes that are happening. This level of access control is difficult when there are potentially billions, if not trillions of documents in the world. How do you make sure everyone has access to the right thing at the right time? What happens if I revoke access and edit the document? How do I make sure the person who was previously looking at the document doesn't see those changes? These Questions uh, drive a scalability question. How do I create one good version of authorization um, for everyone? And that's the goal of what we're trying to do with Sandcastle. So how do we know that we've built one good version at Auth0 for authorization? Well, looking at my example of Google, we know that we've done a good job because we've learned from the best. In 2019, Google released the Google Zanzibar paper. Uh, this was an abstract that their developers put together around how they developed their global authorization system. The thing that drives Google Drive, Google Workspaces, all of the custom roles um, that are available to an administrator of Google Groups and Google Workspaces, um, YouTube, Photos, all the different applications that Google has in their stack, BigQuery, GCP, all of them run off a single authorization provider. 
how did they do it? How did they create a single authorization service for such a diverse uh, group of applications? And what were the different considerations that they used? Well, for, for Google, everything has to be scalable. Nothing can be small. Uh, everything has to be accessible. And so they built uh, a highly ex uh, accessible system, but they also had to build an extensible system. I've been at organizations that I've been told as a product manager, well, no, you can't add that feature because our authorization system wasn't built like that. We would have to rebuild everything from scratch uh, in order to make that happen. Well, when you're operating uh, an enterprise like Google, being able to innovate is part of the game. And so how do you make your authorization system extensible and changeable? And then also, how do you make it auditable so that you can understand what's happening in your system to make sure that it's not going wrong, to write tests against different versions, uh, to make sure that you have a good understanding of what's going to happen in the system. All of this was explained in the Google Zanzibar paper. And so when we read it, we said, aha, well, this is one good version of authorization uh, that Google made. But unfortunately, it's not for you. It wasn't for us either. Google's kept it proprietary uh, for their applications, unlike services like Google Spanner that they've added to GCP. And so when we read this paper, we set out to say, all right, we're gonna take the learnings that Google's published. We're gonna build a version that's available to everyone uh, so you can build it into your applications. And so how does Zanzibar work? What's so special about the Google Zanzibar paper that's created one good version of authorization for everybody? Well, sometimes it's easier to talk about what it's not. So what it's not is RBAC and ABAC. So more industry acronyms. Uh, for those that are implementing authorization systems, most of you probably know RBAC, which is role-based access control. Uh, a lot of organizations go with RBAC because it's easy to implement. It gives you the idea of administrators or employees or different roles that you can build into your application that give you different levels of access. And maybe you combine roles with the idea of tenants or organizations so that you can have an admin in one organization access only the data of that organization. Role-based access control is great to get authorization off the ground. The problem is if you have billions or trillions of photos in your system that you wanna create a sharing system on, or maybe you want to give uh, access to specific rows in a database, it's very hard to build a system based on RBAC. Because what are you going to do? Create a role for every single photo in the world? You'd have trillions of photos to manage. That's both a human and a technical problem. The human problem in that is how do you manage all those roles? Who has insight to all of them? God forbid someone leaves from your organization who knew and created all of those roles. How is someone going to parse through what all those different roles do? in order to edit and continue that role-based system going forward. And then from a technical perspective, if you want to pass you know, 100 roles in an HTTP editor in order to give access to very specific things, you're not going to have enough room. Uh, and so you can't even, in a lot of different applications, pass that much information in order to maintain RBAC. And so a lot of organizations go to ABAC, access, uh, attribute-based access control which is great because ABAC is a catch-all for anything. Uh, ABAC is based off the idea that you look uh, at an attribute on the person or an attribute on the object that they're trying to access, and you make that authorization decision based on one of those attributes. Well, technically everything is an attribute. So you can say RBAC is just a version of ABAC. A role is just an attribute uh, on someone's uh, profile. Uh, and so with ABAC, you have to define your authorization system from scratch. You have to decide what attributes are valuable. You have to build policies around those attributes and manage those policies. And if you try and give access to individual level rows in a database or photos in a giant photo library, you run into the same problems where you have to deal with a policy for every single um, object and you get policy explosion instead of role explosion. And so ABAC suffers similar problems in RBAC and the permutations of all the different attributes creates their own technical and human management problem. And so Zanzibar solved this by creating a new type of access control, relationship-based access control or REBAC. And REBAC asks a simple question, is this person sufficiently related to this object such that they can take this action? 
And so it uses graph computing with edges and vertices to traverse through a set of relationships to come up with that simple yes or no answer. You might have someone who is related uh, to a group as an administrator. That administrator has is related to all of the objects in that group as an editor by notion that administrators are related as editors. And so as you traverse that graph, it's very simple to create a tree that you follow to create any authorization decision. Instead of having to manage a whole set of policies or a whole set of roles, you just have to manage the different relationship types uh, that, those or, that those different objects might have in a wider system. Which is great because so much of our world is defined by relationships. I get access to a lot of Auth0 resources, the Auth0 roadmap, the Auth0 benefits, by my relation to Auth0 as a product manager. If my relationship with Auth0 changes, then access to those objects need to change. And so relationships are a natural right way of expressing authorization. So how does it work? How does it actually get built into a stack? It seems like a great idea, uh, but what are the nuts and bolts? So here's an example of one of the different architectures that can be used uh, in someone's stack to build in something like Sandcastle. On the left, you have a user uh, who's looking at an application screen. They want to delete a customer record in your application. Well, as everyone knows, deletion is a destructive action that you want to control. And so when they send that command through the client to uh, your server's APIs, most organizations would create what's called a policy enforcement point or a PEP. That enforcement point would essentially say, hey, I need to check some stuff out. I need to make a decision on whether to let this uh, user through or not. And it would forward all of the information that it got from the client uh, and the application to a policy decision point, which would end up making the decision to let them in or not. That decision point uh, will take all of that contextual information on who the user is, the authenticated user, uh, what they're trying to do, and then read any policies that exist within uh, the organization from a policy authoring point, that's the PAP, um, and then potentially some other contextual information, which would be a policy information point or a PIP. So you can see in this example, Sandcastle off to the right uh, is a store of data for all of your different relationships that would send a message to your policy decision point. Yes, this user is sufficiently related to that customer object to be able to delete them or no, they're not sufficiently related. Now, sometimes a PDP is pretty simple. All it needs is that information from Sandcastle to say yes or no. And it would send that information back to the enforcement point to let the user in or to stop them. In that case, Sandcastle is acting as your policy decision point, the PDP, and the policy information point, the PIP. Sometimes in a complex authorization scenario, you have things like, is this person standing at this location? You need to know that to make the authorization decision. Or sometimes you only want them to give, get access in a time window, like within 10 minutes of something starting. And so those types of authorization decisions that are not based on relationships sometimes require other information points and other policies to make a decision. And that's when Sandcastle acts as just a policy information point within a wider uh, decision point. And so how does Sandcastle make these decisions to be able to authorize different users around the world? So first, in a Zanzibar type system, you have to define the bones uh, of your, your authorization framework. This is the namespace. The namespace has things like documents in a Google Drive scenario. And documents have different relationship types like owner, editor, and viewer. These are stuff that a lot of us have interacted with every day. But you can imagine other examples like an IoT system where you might have an owner and a viewer. Say I've got a smart refrigerator and I wanna let my partner know when we're low on milk, I might share them as a viewer on my uh, different uh, IoT namespace that I would define for my application. Maybe I had a, a business application where I'd want someone to be a manager of a store branch and maybe have a customer of a store branch. That would be a different namespace and those relationships to that branch would be different. 
And so when we talked a little bit earlier about extensibility, the namespace in a Zanzibar style system is how you create new uh, portions of your application and new objects within your application. Spend about five, 10 minutes uh, editing some namespace code and you can get new relationship and authorization schemas added to your wider namespace. This is a great way uh, to add new functionality. So gone are the days where you tell your product manager, no, we can't change that whole authorization scheme. That's gonna take weeks. We'll have to refactor the entire code base. You can add a new set of applications in minutes uh, instead of days or weeks. And then within the bones, you've got to flesh out the, the muscle of the system, which is tuples. These are the facts of a Zanzibar system that in this example, Angela is the owner of the document that is the new roadmap for the organization, and that Ben is shared as an editor of the new roadmap. These facts are constantly changing. They're the sharing actions uh, within a wider uh, Zanzibar style system. And they're the things that Zanzibar is, uh, Sandcastle is querying um, to come up with that yes or no decision, that Charlie is sufficiently related as a viewer of the product uh, slides in this example. And you can create relationships between the different uh, relationship types. So an owner, editor, viewer, you can say that anyone who has the owner properties gets all of the power of an editor or a viewer. And so that someone could just have a tuple to be an owner. And then when you try to query the system and ask, hey, can I give them viewer uh, features as well? It's gonna return yes, uh, because of the namespace and how it's defined. And so this type of application gives you an incredible amount of power to build authorization as a service uh, across um, APIs and as its own uh, software as a service for developers. And it's going to be one good version of authorization as a service for everyone to, to use going forward. So if you're interested in learning more, as I said, this is an Auth0 Labs uh, new initiative. It's a new product. Um, you can reach out to us on Twitter uh, at Auth0 Labs. Uh, we have a playground set up that anyone can use and anyone can create an application on uh, at learn.sandcastle.cloud. Uh, and from there, from either of those locations, the Twitter or the playground, um, you can find our Discord server and talk directly to me uh, and the other engineers on the Auth0 Labs team and figure out if Sandcastle is a good way for you uh, to build fine grain authorization as a service into your application. Hi, Sam. Thank you so much for sharing um, what's, uh, what sort of like innovation is going on at Auth0 and what Sandcastle is, or rather what it's not. <laughs> um, I've had a couple of questions come through from the chat. Um, so one of the questions is, what are some of the alternatives in the authorization space? And are there any other API driven alternatives to this Zanzibar style system? Sure. Um, so as I talked about before, there are different organizations that are building um, RBAC style authorization systems um, that fit into that more role-based model. Um, organizations like OSO, um, and then there are organizations that are building um, more ABAC style. Open policy um, agent is uh, something that's helping with um, policy management of complex uh, ABAC based systems um, and can be used. I know um, that's open source software and you can rely on an organization like Styra uh, to help you kind of work through um, utilizing that. Um, there are organizations that are uh, trying to build Zanzibar as a library uh, instead of a software as a service. You know, we've taken the position that this is something that's going to need to get changed and improved over time. Um, and in order to put the resources to that, it makes more a little bit more sense as a as a service. Um, but uh, Orikido is building it um, as a sidecar that you can uh, build against your applications in house. Yeah, um, so going off of that, I'm just interested to know, like switching over to something like Sandcastle, where can you extract the most value out of it? Sure, so it's the type of system that works well when you have a lot of um, 
individual items that you want to give authorization to. So taking the Google Drive example of trillions of documents, organizations are using it um, as giving authorization to different IoT devices in their stack. So giving someone management access over a smart light or um, technician access over a camera so to grab diagnostics. Um, different organizations are building it into uh, different work order management. Um, so who gets access to add notes to a work order? Can someone delete notes on that work order um, to kind of do that fine grain um, access to different record systems? Um, other organizations are using it to do application data access management. Um, you might, you know, again, with all of the different uh, data breaches and security incidents, one of the issues with role-based access control uh, is that once you compromise one of those higher level roles, you get access to almost everything. Well, if something's done via relationships, you can give far more minute access to the right person. Um, and so you might have, uh, you know, data row access given uh, via fine grain authorization um, so that someone needs to be related to that data row uh, rather than the you know, system writ large, um, giving you another point of access control over your data. Um, and so you can have trillions of uh, database rows and still manage access with a system like Sandcastle at that row level in the database. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for your time presenting at API Days Australia. Um, it's been great listening to your talk. I just want to thank you. Um, sure.